Part 2, Chapter 8 Mr. Golding idled the black Ford sedan on Amaryllis Drive, where the homes kept their distance from the neighbors in the street. After they climbed out, Mr. Golding said, Good luck to you, Mr. Howard. I'm headed to the courthouse now. I'm glad I'm not the one to tell her. He honked the car horn and pulled away. Frankie waved. Mr. Howard shook his head, smiling, and pushed open the wrought iron gate. At the end of a long walkway sat a caramel-colored house with white trim and red accents. An elevated porch with a wooden latticework skirt wrapped around two sides of the first level. A round two-story tower with a cone-shaped roof jutted from the left corner of the house and was topped with a weather vane. Steep gables pointed to the sky. Frankie stopped open-mouthed and stared. It's lovely, isn't it? said Mr. Howard, taking his hand. Queen Anne architecture. It needs some updating inside, but she's a beauty. How many people live here? asked Frankie. Mr. Howard laughed. Just one woman, and now you, and Michael. Mike's eyes swept across the wide lawns, the old elm in the side yard, and the manicured hedges. We're going to live here, Mike, said Frankie, grinning from ear to ear. He let go of Mr. Howard's hand and skipped toward the house. We're being adopted, not fostered. Mike wanted to feel Frankie's joy, but some tiny intuition told him it had been all too easy. In only a matter of hours, they had been gathered up with their few belongings and brought here. Fostering was one thing, but adoption was another. It meant being part of the family. Forever. But no one ever adopted children without meeting them first. Granny always said if something seemed too good to be true, it was probably a swindle. At the market, she had once showed him how the shiny waxed apples on top of the bushel often hid the bruised and rotten ones underneath. Was this house a shiny apple hiding something? A dark-skinned man knelt by a flower bed near the porch. As they approached, he set his trowel aside and stood, his height and sturdiness now apparent. Mr. Howard waved to him. Hello, Mr. Potter. This is Miss Michael and Franklin, Mrs. Sturbridge's new wards. Mr. Potter looked from one to the other, wiped his hands on his green apron, and nodded. Pleased to meet you. Mr. Howard turned to Mike and Frankie. Mr. Potter is the groundskeeper and Mrs. Sturbridge's driver. He picks up, the, he picks the Packard up and run. Oh, excuse me. He keeps the Packard up and running. He is also married to Mrs. Potter, the housekeeper. Mr. Potter, would you like to come inside for the introductions? Mr. Potter shook his head. I best get back to the geraniums. Seems safer. Mr. Howard, sir, you just stirred the pot real good. He winked at the boys. What pot? Asked Frankie. Mr. Howard smiled. He just means things will. Be different around here from now on. Mike and Frankie followed Mr. Howard up the wide porch steps where he rang the bell. Here we go, boys. A woman in a gray dress and white apron opened the door. A pleated maid's cap like a crescent moon perched on her head. Her brown skin was the same color as her sleek back hair, which was knotted in a bun at the nape of her neck. Hello, Mrs. Potter, said Mr. Howard. Here we are. This is Michael and this is Franklin. Boys, meet the woman who runs this house. Mrs. Potter raised her eyebrows at Mr. Howard. Before you say anything, said Mr. Howard, yes, they are boys, and there are two of them. Where is she? In the library, sir, and might I say you are a brave man. I'm glad I'm not the one to tell her. Seemed safer. Stirred the pot real good. Brave man. Why were they all talking in code? He and Frankie had been adopted. Wouldn't Mrs. Sturbridge be happy to see them? They followed Mr. Howard inside and stood in an entry hall the size of Granny's entire apartment. The floor was a checkerboard of black and white square marble squares. A wide stairway with a dark wood banister hugged the left wall and curved toward the second story. Wow, whispered Frankie, craning his neck upward and pointing to the gilded chandelier dripping with three layers of giant teardrop crystals. She must have lots of money. "'Shh,' said Mike, even though that was exactly what he was thinking. So this was how rich folks lived. Mike had never felt poor, but he'd never known any different either. When they'd lived with Granny, they'd had enough to eat and a safe place to sleep. And they had Granny, who loved them. So nothing else mattered. She used to say she never wanted for splendor as long as she could have a piano and her two boys. If she could have seen all this... She would have said that none of it made one bit of difference unless the owner's heart was as beautiful as the house.
Michael, Franklin, wait here. Mr. Howard pointed to an upholstered bench. He walked through a set of double doors on the left and shut them part way behind him. Mrs. Potter headed down the hallway, shaking her head. There's a storm brewing, sure as I live. Mike sat on the bench and watched Frankie walk halfway up the staircase. Boys, yelled a woman's voice from behind the doors. I send for one girl and you come back with two boys? How could you? Mike felt his stomach twist. He checked to see if Frankie heard, but he was too preoccupied with sliding his hand along the stair banister. You appointed me your representative, so I made the decision, said Mr. Howard. And it's the right one. The papers have been filed. They're brothers, and I couldn't bring myself to separate them. You'll understand that, I hope, and besides, two will be easier. They'll have each other. Now come and meet them, and they're in the hall. Her voice was shrill. What have you done? Only what was required, said Mr. Howard, something you left until the final hour. I never thought it would come to this. I'm trying to get things changed. I'm afraid you're out of time, said Mr. Howard. Mike heard something hit the wall and then glass breaking. Frankie darted from the stairs to Mike's side. It's okay, Frankie, whispered Mike. At least he hoped it was. She had wanted a girl, and Mr. Howard came back with them. If it had mattered so much, why hadn't she chosen a child herself? Something didn't feel right. Mike pulled Frankie in front of him and looked him square in the eyes. We need to watch our every step and remember our manners. We don't want to get her angry, understand? Before Frankie could answer, Mr. Howard stepped out of the library. He stood by the door, waiting. A woman appeared next to him, her mouth set in a grim line. Even though her face was red from crying or anger, Mike couldn't tell which, he could still see the brilliant yellow flecks in her hazel eyes. Her brown hair was a short bob of curls. Her black dress came past her knees. In her high-heeled shoes, she was as tall as Mike, but thin as a willow. Powdery vanilla scent surrounded her. The way Frankie gazed up at her, Mike could see he was smitten. Michael, Franklin, this is Eunice Dow Sturbridge, said Mr. Howard. Mike nodded. Ma'am, thank you for adopting us. Frankie blurted, Are you going to be our new mother? You are much prettier than we expected, and you smell lots better than Mrs. Pennyweather. Mrs. Sturbridge's eyes filled with tears as she looked them over and made a face as if she'd just seen a dead animal in the gutter. She turned and hurried up the stairs. At the top, she leaned over the railing and yelled, Get them to Mrs. Potter immediately! She disappeared down the hallway. A few seconds later, a door slammed so hard that the chandelier tinkled. Believe it or not, boys, said Mr. Howard, that went well.